Uh, greetings. I am uh, Professor Nicholas Rao from uh, the. Uh, I am a. Uh, I teach Greek and Roman history at the School of Languages and Cultures at Purdue University. Uh, and I am going to make this presentation today, uh, Searching for Pirates, the Rough Cilicia Archaeological Survey Project. Uh, I had the opportunity, I received permission from the Turkish Ministry of Culture to investigate the region of Rough Cilicia uh, in 1996, and we ran a survey there through 2014, so more than uh, 15 seasons that we spent in this region. And the premise was that we were looking for the notorious Pirates of uh, Cilicia. Uh, these are my publications on the uh, far end. You have um, the uh, Sacred Bonds of Commerce, my study of the Roman trading community at Delos. Uh, the opposite end, you have Merchant Sailors and Pirates in the Roman World, kind of a summary of the survey uh, as it was in 2003. And then most recently, we have the digital repository of the ceramic remains of the survey. Uh, posted at the Purdue um, um, uh, repository for digital uh, ma uh, materials. It's known as PUR, P U R R. Uh, so you're welcome to look at all three of these. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, so Cilicia is this hump on the south coast of Turkey, directly north of Cyprus. It's called Rough Cilicia because the Taurus Mountains there basically descend from about 6,000 feet directly to the sea in less than 15 to 20 kilometers. It's a very narrow coastal area, very few um, plains, shall we say. So there's no major settlements. This is very, very small places along this coast. Uh, and where our permit was, was in the district of Ghazi Pasha, which is what we would call technically Western Rough Cilicia. Uh, and here is the survey map, and you can see the various sites that we investigated over the course of the survey. Next slide. Okay, so this discussion is going to proceed in three parts, each one shorter than the first, the previous. Uh, first, we will look at the topographical history of the Cilician pirates. Uh, then we will look at the field methodologies that we use in the field. And then finally, we will look at the results for piracy from our survey, such as they were, which I can tell you right now is the shortest part, very meager results in this regard. But that's kind of indicative of the nature of piracy, perhaps uh, ancient and modern. Next slide. Uh, and we have to put it in a historical context of the late Republic. Here is a list of all the various conflicts that happened during the major conflicts that happened during the uh, late Republic. I've highlighted that the Cilician pirates, but you can see it's embedded in a, just a ferocious era of conflict. Uh, there were civil wars between the Romans, and the Italians and Roman leaders such as Sulla and Marius or Pompey and Caesar. Uh, there were conflicts with the renegades such as Quintus Sertorius in Spain or King Mithridates of Pontus. Uh, it was a tumultuous era, and I like to think of it as a moment in which sort of the Eastern Mediterranean area of the Hellenistic world, the successor states of the conquest of Alexander the Great, uh, were colliding mostly violently with the Western part of the Mediterranean, the era area of the Roman Republic and its ingrowing provincial uh, territories. Uh, and ultimately, this sort of, a, it's an interesting moment because there was growth, there was uh, sort of expanding trade, uh, and yet a lot of violence. And it seems like just before the founding of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, uh, the Roman Empire, it always seems to be at these kind of junctures that we see things like this occur. Maybe it's sort of like the, I think of the pirates as a highly mobile element. Maybe they're the last of the renegades that the Romans had to deal with as they, as they uh, uh, took possession of the Mediterranean. Okay, next slide. Uh, and to understand piracy, we have to begin by talking about sailors. Uh, and here we have some Roman era reliefs of sailors uh, and some interesting features that we could uh, mention here. First of all, you'll notice in these reliefs that figures such as captains and the first mate are dressed. They have tunics. And yet the sailors themselves have no clothes. They are nude. They are barefoot. And this is something that we hear, although limitedly, 
from the sources is that sailors were so the, 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 the least regarded of laborers of the ancient uh, Mediterranean world. Um, they were, uh, again, we only have a few references, but they were uh, uh, slaves uh, or young boys sold into slavery by their parents. They were also sort of criminals, whip-scarred uh, criminals who could not find employment on land. So we have to think of this in a couple of ways. First, the inherent danger of travel by sea uh, in antiquity. Um, uh, they didn't have charts. You could uh, collide with submerged rocks. You could be tipped over in a storm. You could be attacked by pirates. You could be attacked by warring states. Uh, people didn't really know how to swim, so to go down the sea was very perilous in that regard. And so it was sort of like uh, you couldn't find work on land, and that element was slaked off the land out to the world of the decks of these rickety ships where uh, life was hazardous. Uh, at the same time, uh, these ancient sailing ships were very large, and they represented uh, the largest and most technologically advanced workplace uh, of the ancient world. Um, they had uh, masts with sails, with brails that had to be pulled. Off. Every single rope had a, a defining term for it. The captain barks out the orders and you had to respond this way. They had capstans to pull up anchors. They had pumps to pump out the bilge. Uh, all of these machines could uh, disable a sailor, take out an eye, take off a finger, take off a leg this way. And so at the same time that it was dangerous, what we're looking at is the development of uh, work that was collective. Sailors had to work together to propel the ship and make use of the winds. Uh, and they also had to be knowledgeable of the seas, the navigation routes, the sight of a storm on the distance. They can smell it in the air. A lot of this comes from the very long apprenticeship at sea. Uh, next slide. Uh, and so this was a harsh, uh, um, uh, environment to work in. Uh, what we know is that uh, in transatlantic uh, trade of the early modern era, uh, most sailors bore it begrudgingly, but bore it. Uh, but a small element, uh, maybe as many as maybe 5,000 at all, uh, stepped over the line into piracy. So they started as sailors and they become outlaws. Uh, and the problem becomes when they become outlaws, these are highly skilled outlaws. They have learned the trade routes of the merchants and the financiers who invest and make this trade happen. Uh, they know where its choke points are. They know how to attack it. And they are highly mobile. They can move from, uh, from if there's evidence of a Rohan squadron bearing down them or the Romans. They can continually relocate and hide in the um, uh, littoral environment of the Mediterranean with all its many fjords and islands and hidden coves and things like that. And so uh, what we end up with, and I'm going to use uh, Marcus Redeker's award-winning book, uh, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea, I call these Redeker's Rules for Piracy. What do you need for large-scale piracy of the scale that we hear the Cilician pirates were? Uh, first of all, uh, pirates uh, tended to seek a political no man's land where local autonomy was weak. Uh, and in this era, it seems to be this Bay of Pamphylia where the Seleucid Empire was imploding. It was nothing but civil wars. Where the Ptolemaic Empire was weak and we hear that they were basically blackmailed by the pirates in this era. Uh, and where uh, uh, the Adelids in Pergamum, the Rhodians and the Romans kind of stood back and watch this disaster unfold because they had had their share of dealings with the Seleucids and this seemed like a, an opportune moment in that regard. So uh, there is an area here where there was no home rule, no real means of suppressing the pirates. Uh, and so they find asylum there. They can, they can collect from various uh, uh, mobile flights, shall we say, in that regard. Uh, uh, and, um, uh, okay, let's move on to the second point. Uh, uh, they tend to settle pirates along uh, important maritime trading routes. In this instance, this is the most important route of the Eastern Mediterranean. It's the route of the Egyptian grain trade. 
bringing that excess surplus grain from Egypt against the winds, crawling up to the north and wending its way along the south coast of Anatolia to the Aegean uh, and all the way to Italy and Sicily. So they situate themselves in an area of asylum and they can attack passing trade uh, in this manner. Uh, the third rule is that pirates tend to furnish a black market component to otherwise legitimate trading networks. Uh, this kind of makes sense when you remind yourself that pirates did not farm, they did not sustain themselves, they prayed for their uh, uh, sustenance. So if they take a ship and it's got nothing but textiles, they've got to find a way to translate that textiles into what they need. So you need a fence. You need a harbor that's going to connive with the pirates and let them conduct their business to sell what they've captured for what they need. And what we hear is that many states along the Bay of Pamphylia, Cide, uh, Adelia, Espendos, uh, Fazalis, uh, Olympos, um, worked with the pirates if they didn't actually, weren't actually taken over by the pirates. And so this whole Bay of Pamphylia became kind of a, uh, uh, a dangerous uh, environment, shall we say, with uh, pirate uh, marauding going on. Uh, in addition, we hear that the Roman commercial outpost in the Aegean, Delos, um, uh, also uh, uh, welcomed the pirates. So what we know is that during the war with Perseus, uh, at the end of this war in 167 BC, the uh, um, uh, priestly caste at Delos that had run the sanctuary there were expelled. It was given over to the Athenians as a province on condition that no import and export taxes could be charged on any transit trade going through the island. And what this did was create a tax-free, a duty-free zone for Roman merchants to situate themselves on the island in order to connect to the luxury trade in the east. Now, we have merchants that came from as far away as um, Yemen but certainly Syria and Palestine. And it's clear that a lot of what they were going after were these exotic prestige goods coming from as far as way, the Indus and possibly uh, China. Uh, but what we are told is that they particularly liked the prisoners that were being captured by the Cilician pirates and brought to Delos and sold. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, so for a while, the Romans were colluding with the pirates. Uh, there was a healthy trade going on at Delos. What we are told by Strabo is that myriades, chimiriades, tens and tens of thousands, gaggles of slaves were sold at Delos in a single trading season. Uh, more than you can count is what he seems to be indicating this way. Uh, and the Romans, we know that uh, the, the Romans, this was their main conduit to develop uh, slave labor in Italy and Sicily at this time. And we also know that when the slave rebellions break out in 136, uh, that there are distinct connections between the leaders of the slave rebellion in Sicily and Cilicia, one was a Cilician, and Syria. So there's indications of a, of a line there. We can see this uh, trade and how they moved in this way. Uh, this made the Romans uh, very disliked in the Aegean, uh, and it played into the hands of the last sort of renegade Hellenistic king, Mithridates, King Mithridates VI, Eupator, who took a Philhellenic stand against the Romans and their abuses and their taxation uh, and, uh, and so on. And so he was able to win over support in the Aegean uh, when he invaded Asia in 88 BC and got all the way to Athens and took the Piraeus uh, and planted uh, one of his cronies, uh, Athenion, as the tyrant of Athens as well. Uh, and so what's interesting here is that uh, uh, whatever the Romans were doing, it was ugly enough and unpleasant enough to cause a widespread rebellion throughout the region at that time that had to be suppressed. Uh, and Delos became the symbol of this. It became the symbol of everything that was wrong with Roman rule in the Aegean. And so the pirates deliberately attacked it first in 87 and again in 69 BC this way. And so ultimately the trading colony was uh, destroyed. And then by the time things calmed down, Roman interest had moved further east and it was no longer valuable uh, in that regard. Uh, interesting though we need to mention is that uh, the Romans colluded up to a point uh, and then we hear that in 102 BC, they passed a plebiscite, uh, the Lex de Pirates uh, of 102 BC, basically telling, declaring this 
region, which they called Cilicia, to be a military sphere of operations for a Roman general. And they sent uh, Marcus Antonius, uh, the orator. Uh, and um, 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 uh, uh, so what we can see here is that something happened. Uh, at first, they were colluding with the pirates. In 102, they decided they have to deal with this problem. Probably what was going on is that the pirates would sell things to the Romans and then attack them as soon as they left Delos. There is evidence of, uh, there are votives of sailors, uh, merchants on Delos, thanking the gods for being saved from pirates, for example, the date precisely to this era. Uh, so what we can say is something happened, and, and we see this in transatlantic piracy of the early modern era. They would kind of use these pirates as privateers in their wars and then expect them to go back to uh, proper behavior when the war was over. But these are sort of mercenaries who just kind of uh, go into piracy when they weren't being employed. That's not quite the same thing here. Uh, we Privateering is not a, um, this is anachronism for the ancient world, uh, and we have to recognize that. But all the same, there is a progression. The Romans worked with the pirates, they liked what was happening to the Seleucids, and then for some reason they turned against them uh, and engaged in a basically 30-year uh, uh, intermittent desultory conflict against the pirates, where they sent out general after general who succeeded in some marginal way but didn't really eradicate the problem. Uh, ultimately, uh, they had to send in Pompey the Great, 67 BC, to uh, clean it up. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we are looking at the uh, harbor remains, the installations at Delos. I published, uh, wrote about this in my book. We're looking at uh, the line of harbor of the warehouses along the uh, west coast of the island. Uh, in particular, I always point to the warehouse of the columns. This was uh, a very large two-story building, 60 by 40 meters, has a giant... Uh, uh, courtyard in the middle of it and two minor courtyards and it has all these transverse passageways that kind of tell you the flow of traffic. They could bring in commodities from the sides, they face right on the K, we should point out, so right on the water. You can move through these transverse corridors, you can even move through rooms with doorways that were parallel um, out to the main courtyard where there were these socket holes on the columns to provide folding tables so people could stand things there and maybe up on the second floor there are merchants bidding on the commodities this way. So commodities could be priceless goods or it could be prisoners. And maybe these rooms are to clean up the prisoners and cut their hair, we're told, before they auction them off. Uh, notice that there's a big door in the middle though, so once the auction's over, everything can proceed outward uh, back in on the ship. And that's what Strabo actually tells us. He tells us that merchants would pull up with ships at Delos and the merchant, his assistant on the dock would say, Get them off and put them on this boat over here. They're already sold. Next slide, please. So um, when we look for material remains to sort of track the pattern of piracy and trade in this era, the principal form that we look to are their shipping containers, which we call transport amphoras. These are large ceramic jars. They stand about a meter tall. Uh, they hold about eight to 10 gallons each. And you can see how they were stacked in the holds of ships, sometimes as much as six deep. Uh, at least two cargo ships of this era have been found that contain the estimate is about 10,000 jars. So 10,000 times eight gallons, and you get a sense of the scale of this sort of trade. Right, next slide. Okay, and why is this important? Because there are certain types that show up in particular at Delos. There, this was a trading community of Romans. It's estimated maybe the total population at its peak in uh, 100 BC was about 20,000 people. A lot of Italians were there and they brought their wine and their olive oil with them. And so when we walk around at Delos, we kick over fragments of these jars constantly. On the extreme end is the Brindisian ovoid jar. Uh, in the middle is the Lambolia II, which came from Apulia and Calabria. And then the taller jar on the other end is a Dressel one that came from the west coast of Italy from Etruria down to Campania. Uh, uh, a great scholar, Andre Chania, wrote a book called Le Vin de l'Italie Romaine, in which he suggested that the wine trade of the Romans, especially in the western provinces, was the engine of the slave trade. Uh, and so we took that hypothesis and we decided, okay, if the 
pirates were dealing with the Romans, then it stands to reason they would have brought these Roman emperors to some degree back to their pirate bases in Cilicia, and we would be able to see the remains of these jars. So we went to Ghazi Pasha looking specifically for these as the temporal designation, the, the cue that we are in the area of the Cilician pirates, the, the time of the pirates, and that whoever is there, they're getting these Roman emperors primarily from Delos. So this was our hypothesis when uh, we set out. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, from the perspective of pirate bases, there are some that are uh, known, were known, we accept uh, the, the argument that way. And you'll notice that almost all of them are situated around the Bay of Pamphylia. Exactly where the border of Pamphylia and Cilicia begins is always a, a debated point in any event. Uh, and it may just be the Romans didn't really know their geography all that well, just called everything Cilicia uh, in, this, in these waters in this regard. Uh, so we're going to look at a few of them. We will look at Olympos. We will look at Corakesion, um, uh, uh, modern day Alanya, and we will look at the notorious Kragos, the base of the Kragos. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here are, is the, the beach and the beautiful view. We can see the, the, it was a, uh, at Olympos. Uh, this was a uh, lagoonal harbor uh, right through to Roman times. Uh, there is an Acropolis. There's very little there that we can say is Hellenistic in date. Um, uh, but what we are told is that this was a notorious base of this pirate chief called Zenicates in 76 BC. Um, he was he was a practitioner of the cult of Mithras, which used fire as sort of its purifying energy. Uh, and it just so happens that in the hills above this site, there are natural jets that are on fire. It's coming up from below the surface. And so it always was known in antiquity as the place of the Shimra. Supposedly the flames could be seen out in seen out in sea this way. And he took this place as his palace, built a fortress there, uh, and he convinced all his warriors that this Mithras cult would bulletproof them against all comers, against the Rhodians, against the Romans, and what have you. Okay, next slide. In the next slide, you can actually see up in the hills there an open area, and that's the area of the jets that come out of here. There's a bunch of them. You have to watch out. You can see me bending forward trying to light a cigarette, and what you don't know is my back foot is getting hot because I was stepping on one of these jets as I sat there. Um, uh, the Romans uh, sent out a general, Publius Cerulius uh, Watia Isauricus, uh, in 78 uh, BC, and he stormed this site. Uh, defeating Zenicides, he retired into his palace, his castle. He set fire to the fortress. His women and children and all his uh, valuables went up in fire. And the Romans were so impressed with this, we are told by Plutarch, that they took the Mithras cult from this site uh, to Italy, and that's where it became uh, transferred to Roman culture. Right. Next slide, please. Uh, the next one is uh, the great promontory of Alanya, modern-day Alanya, ancient Corakesion. What we are told by Plutarch and Appian is that this was the chief pirate base of the Cilician pirates at the time of Pompey. Um, we are told that they had an enormous fleet, uh, more than a thousand ships. They had 90 deck ships. These are ships of the line, the largest ships that existed at this time. Uh, battleships is what we would call them. Uh, they had uh, uh, 30,000 combatants, if we accept the numbers that were given. They had uh, uh, artisans chained to their stations here to build these ships, to build the weapons for them, and to maintain this. Uh, and so um, uh, this was a very important site, shall we say. And this is the place where Pompey ultimately defeated the pirates in 67 BC. Uh, now what we know is that uh, this place was seized by Ptolemy I, around 309 BC, and one presumes that the fortifications here date to that uh, moment. Uh, next slide, please. Here we see the fortifications now there. These are the Celtic fortifications of the Middle Ages, the 14th century. But if you look at that central tower down at the base of it, you can see the uniform courses of ashlar masonry that probably represented a portion of the original fortifications at this site. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is a model of this site. You can see it's just a simple cross wall uh, extending from one of the cliffs in the western end to the harbor on the eastern end. And then there was a transverse wall on the crest to
to prevent people from raiding should they have to abandon the harbor itself. Uh, unfortunately, you can kind of see uh, uh, Hellenistic remains, but it was heavily reworked in the Celtic era. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, here we have the uh, uh, ship sheds of uh, the Celtic era. We have the Tershane uh, that date to about 1350. You can see them from the outside and situated at the harbor where the uh, original ones would have stood in the classical period as well as the galleries inside. And then we're looking out across the harbor up above to the Dimchai. This is one of the great river channels and these river channels in Cilicia are very um, short. Uh, they descend very rapidly from the mountains. And you, what you want to do is get up at about 1800 meters. Uh, between 1500 and 1800 meters is the natural environment of the, the uh, primordial cedar forest that existed here at that time. We're talking about trees that stand 100 feet tall and 15 feet in diameter. And cedar is absolutely essential for shipbuilding because it is rock resistant. It's great for planking. It's great for mast. And so we shouldn't be surprised that the pirates have situated themselves here in order to have access to the timber resources to build the navy that they allegedly had. Okay. Next slide. Uh, and then the last is the Kragos. Uh, you, here you see it, Kragos, the craggy mountain. It is some um, 800 feet, a vertical cliff. Um, what we know about this site, this is complicated. I should point out that my former colleagues, Michael Hoff of Nebraska, University of Nebraska, and Rice Townsend of Clark University are, have been excavating this site for the past uh, 14 years. Uh, and um, uh, what we know is that um, it was created into a settlement by a client king uh, who worked together with Caligula and Claudius. So, his name was Antiochus IV of Comagene. Uh, he was invited into this region because the natives were disturbing the peace. Uh, and he seized control of this site and he named it Antiochia Ad Kragum. Antiochia after himself. Which one? The one on the Kragos. Which Kragos? The craggy mountain of the pirates. And what we were told by Appian is that at the time of the pirates, this was an impregnable. Uh, pirate base, not surprising, uh, but he gives some topographical information as well. He says there is this one mountain, the Kragos, right above the sea, and now in front there's another, Andi Kragos, uh, the craggy mountain out in front, and that matches the topography of this site perfectly. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, I'm going to let this run. Uh, this is a view, just gives you a view of the uh, the uh, uh, elevation right there above the sea. And when you finish, next slide. Uh, but at the Antikragos, there is actually a pirate's cove. And I have seen large fishing boats sail in. It's about 60 feet deep. The ceiling of this cave is about 40 feet high. Uh, it is, when we first got here, we decided here we actually have a pirate's cove. Surely, surely, we're going to find remains of the Cilician pirates here. It couldn't be more evident. So again, run this slide as well. And I'll give you the videos, Matt. Okay, next slide. Uh, there's a view of the Antikragos, and what you can see, the cove is down in that uh, rock to the to the left. Uh, on the right, you have a Byzantine Seljuk fortress uh, right above what used to be the ancient harbor of Antioch. Uh, there you can see the hole in the lower photo. You can see the hole of the Pirate's Cove. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we surveyed this very thoroughly, um, and we found minimal remains dating to the era of the pirates. As you can see from the shirts I'm showing you here, what we have here is late Roman and Byzantine, especially uh, uh, scraffito ware is the lower form right there. Uh, and so what I'm trying to tell you is that, uh, you know, we were funded three times by the National Science Foundation. Uh, we were funded twice by the National Geographic Society and other funding from universities. And uh, boy, we didn't find, we didn't find uh, an eye patch. We didn't find any peg legs. We didn't find any parrot bones. Uh, very disappointing from the perspective of trying to find pirates. Uh, what we did do was map this minimal landscape 
uh, and minimally explored landscape and fill in a lot of data. And so we know a lot about rough Silesia. It was kind of called the black hole of the Mediterranean before we started work there. Uh, but from the perspective, narrow perspective of what my principal objective was, this really did not come out uh, the way I had anticipated. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but if we look at this sort of topographically, what do we see? We see this sort of embayment of Pamphylia. You've got these pretty large cities, Cide, Espendos, Perge, Adelia, Cilion. Uh, in the middle, it's a nice rich plain. They could sustain themselves. And then you notice that you get out to the wings where the mountains come close to the sea. You've got Fazalis and Olympos, two notorious pirate bases out there in eastern Cilicia. You've got uh, Antioch and Corcesion out in the wing, almost like pincers. Uh, and what it may have been is sort of a moment where the Pamphylian uh, community started to exert a sort of power at sea. And maybe they, these pirates were actually noble warriors of this community. It's hard to really say. I mean, we don't know enough about them this way. But it would, you know, this is a kind of uh, area where if the Rhodians came the, into the cities, they'd say, we don't know anything about piracy. The pirates are way out there in those spaces. And so it's the perfect kind of convenient. We can offer the fence for them and then deny them should they get captured in this way. And so this may be a large component to the problem. Next slide. Um, and beyond that, uh, though, what we know is that uh, what the sources tell us is that when the Romans started really bearing down on this region during the Mithridatic Wars, uh, noblemen uh, fled their situations and found refuge with the pirates in Cilicia. And so the sources tell us that the pirate fleets were the best professional sailors of the times. They were the best uh, uh, navigators. They were the best warriors at sea. Uh, and they had uh, a leading intelligentsia join them to make them uh, a very formidable force of maybe 20, 30,000 uh, warriors. Uh, and we're also told that they sort of defied Roman Imperium. Uh, and to Trying to find parallels for this, I turn again to Marcus Redeker's book, uh, Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea. Uh, and there's sort of principles that we see with piracy at this scale. Uh, pirates try to form sort of utopian communities in contradistinction to the hierarchical norms that put them as sailors at the bottom of the laboring classes to begin with. So what have they done? They found an asylum, they found the means to survive, they've got people colluding with them, and they're finally free. And as free men, temporarily, what do they want? And we see them expressing their freedom in ways that might be a little sort of offbeat to us. Uh, uh, what we hear is they, they wore lavish, loud clothing, broad brimmed hats and eye patches. Um, they loved drinking and wenching and loud music and gaudy sails. They would sail into these uh, harbors and maraud harbors with music playing from the decks of their ships. Uh, they had outlandish titles. They called themselves admirals and tyrants and kings. Uh, they used Hollywood stage names such as Agamemnon or Pergamio right out of the, the uh, uh, middle comedy. Uh, and they created anarchic democracies. Uh, they elected their pirate chiefs. Uh, they wrote articles of agreement for distri distribution of the booty that they uh, captured. Um, they took care of disabled pirates and their women and their children. I mean, this persisted for about 40 years, so we've got a couple of generations uh, in which it sustained itself. They wrote letters of introduction and letters of credit uh, to distant pirate bands. They befriended pirates and created a sort of a pirate network that enabled them to sail from this region all the way to Sertorius's holdout, the Anium in Spain, and make what Cicero called the pirate round, just marauding the Mediterranean during the sailing season this way. Uh, and they displayed contempt for Roman status hierarchy. Uh, they kidnapped VIPs. They loved going into Italy and doing this sort of thing. Uh, they raided Roman harbors. They went inland in Italy and set fire to crops. Uh, they, it's possible that when the Romans started sending their generals into this region, the pirates decided we better create 
problems for them in the West uh, to keep them away from here in that way. And that may be a factor in it. But we're told that uh, in one instance, according to Plutarch, a Roman senator, uh, dignitary got up and said, you can't do this to me. I'm a Roman citizen. Uh, and they said, oh, well, you were wearing a toga. How did we know? Here, yeah, someone gave him a toga. And they dressed him up and they got down on hands and knees and apologized profusely for him. And they put the plank out and said, okay, you're free to go. And when he wouldn't uh, go, they threw him overboard. Again, this sort of contempt for the hierarchy that had oppressed them. And now they have turned the tables and were meeting out justice on uh, their terms in that regard. And then they also offered, uh, we're told, uh, support to other resistance elements, including the great slave rebellion of Spartacus. Okay. Next slide. Uh, here are busts of uh, Lucius Sulla. He fought the first war against Mithridates, and as he was leaving to go back and fight a civil war in Rome, he actually saw the pirates uh, raid the sanctuary at Samothrace. Uh, one of the problems with these Romans is that, okay, they'd like to deal with the pirates, but they're also having civil wars and wars with Mithridates and wars in Gaul and wars in Spain, civil um, uh, slave rebellions. I mean, this was one of many so we say problems on their desk. Uh, they could get to it intermittently, as I said. Uh, Julius Caesar was kidnapped by the pirates as a young uh, noble. He was sailing to Rhodes to get a uh, study with the great rhetorician there and was kidnapped by pirates, uh, as was uh, Publius Claudius Polcare, as was the aunt of Marcus Antonius. Uh, they loved kidnapping Romans uh, because it, again, set the Romans low and established a, a sort of authority of the pirates themselves. Next slide. Uh, and so here's a map just showing incidences of pirate raids. And we can't be insistent that they are all done by Cilicians. But if the pirates are kind of working together in any way, you can see how this, this kind of spread across the Mediterranean this way. And it got to the point in 74 BC where they were able to shut down the sea lanes and the, and the grain supply to the city of Rome and bread riots and famine broke out in Rome itself. And at that point, the Romans realized, okay, this is really a problem. Uh, people can't even sail in the winter time. Something has to be done about this. Uh, and so through a plebiscite, they elected Pompey the Great, uh, who had just defeated Sertorius and Spartacus with the help of Crassus. And now he was being commissioned uh, this enormous power to go off and eradicate piracy throughout the Mediterranean. He was given like 25 legates and a giant armada and absolute authority, Imperium, Maius Imperium, so that any province he might step into, he had superior authority over the governor in that province. Uh, and so he dispatched his legates throughout the Mediterranean, positioned them to pin down pirates locally, while he swept from the west, from Spain, swept across the Mediterranean, driving all these pirates to Cilicia. At the same time, he announced that all those who surrender before a certain date would be shown leniency. So he gave them an out, and that was his main objective. And what we're told is ultimately, out of these 30,000, 20,000 surrendered, hoping that he would treat them with kindness, uh, but 10,000, mindful of the crimes they had committed, went to Corcesion, and he had to attack and besiege the site, and 10,000 fought to their death. Um, after that, with the prisoners, he decided, you know, these are just poor men, laborers who need a second chance, and so he put them on colonies, the most famous one being Soli in eastern Cilicia. This now became Soli Pompeopolis, one of the great harbors of the Mediterranean. Uh, Epiphania on the other side of Cilicia is another one. Another one was uh, on the Peloponnesus near Patrai, and then even in Tarentum they were situated. And so Pompey settled the pirates, and not surprisingly, um, 20 years later, when he has his war with Julius Caesar and he has to flee to the east, who is his admiral? Tarcondimotus, a descendant of the Cilician pirates. Uh, he basically planted the seed that he fully expected he would need at a future day. And the Cilicians remained a problem right through to Sexus Pompey, the, the pirate general there. Uh, they were there with him. Uh, and so uh, it was a, a process, but ultimately Augustus, uh, Octavian eradicated all of this. That concludes part one. We get sort of a topographical history of the pirates and their region. Uh, now we're going to go to the second phase, which is looking at the results of the archaeological survey. 
Uh, and uh, we're going to look at three phases of this. We've tried a number of different methods to try to maximize our research uh, in uh, Ghazi Pasha. Uh, we will look at the results of the architectural survey as it pertains to evidence for the pirates. We will look at the results of the pedestrian survey. This is basically the ceramic results as it pertains to the pirates. And then uh, we will look at the results of the maritime survey uh, as it pertains to the pirates. Okay, next slide, please. Um, again, field survey is a lot different than excavation. I like to say, you know, archaeology goes on so many different ways. I think of all these different methods we use as sort of a portfolio of tools. And uh, what survey can do is go into an uninvestigated region and sort of identify remains, uh, big towns, small settlements, isolated farms, and put them on a map uh, in order of hierarchy so that people later can decide if they want to further the investigation. So what we did is sort of a phase one survey, just trying to map uh, what was out there in that regard. Uh, and I should point out, Russellus here really is rough. It's uh, rural, it's covered with nasty, prickly scrub brush. Typically, uh, they grow up over the ruins because the farmers don't want to farm where there's a lot of stone. Uh, and so we have to go in with machetes. It's a laborious process, but we were able to map remains. Here you can see our surveyor using a total station on top of a Roman tomb at um, uh, Giulio Sebaste uh, and, um, uh, and record. And we have to make a kind of judicious decision about what is mappable and what isn't in that regard. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and then we have to set the context for this. We're talking about warfare, we're talking about warriors, and so we have to recognize that the Hellenistic era was a moment of significant technological change. What we know is that uh, naval warfare in particular transcended from the small open galleys, triremes, to large decked warships. Uh, and the decks could not only mean that you could put a lot of marines on it and conduct land warfare at sea, as the Romans did against the Carthaginians, but it also means you could have uh, 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 positions there for firing machines. And so what we know is this was the era of the development of uh, torsion-propelled um, projectile firing machines, catapults, ballistae, uh, and they could fire not only large arrows that could smash through the deck of a ship, but they could also fire large rocks that could pound a fortification wall incessantly and absolutely destroy it. And where this was most significant was with harbors, but we're talking about pirates and their harbors. And so this is what the advantage of deck ships were, according to the great book by William Murray, The Age of Titans. Uh, it was a form of naval siege warfare. And cities that wanted to resist this onslaught had to have very strong fortifications or they would be taken and fortified by their oppressor, typically one of these successor kings of Alexander the Great. So here you can see some diagrams of the ships. Notice this one in the photograph. This is the great pleasure craft of Nero that was founded at late in MEB prior to World War II. Um, it was a presumably a Roman grain ship of the era that was used to convey grain from Egypt to Rome. Uh, you can see the people in the foreground to get a sense of scale. This thing was more than 300 feet long and over 100 feet across. Uh, just to give you a sense of just how big these warships and grain ships could be in this era. Okay. Next slide, please. Uh, here's some examples of the various weapons. And what we know, interestingly, is that according to Marsden's book on uh, uh, Roman catapults, is that uh, they would uh, adjust it and adjust it and get it. Once it's set, they would aim at a weak spot in the wall. They could fire this thing repeatedly uh, and expect to hit within a square meter on that wall from about 200 meters away. So if you've got some weak spot in the wall, uh, it's going to break it in time. And that's what's going on here uh, that, that, trans, that cha transformed the nature of warfare in the Hellenistic period. And why does this matter? Because um, uh, if we're going to look for pirate remains, then we're going to look for these kinds of fortifications that include things like large blocks of ashlar masonry that are uh, quarry faced on the exterior, bossed to resist the impact of these stones, but their joints will be 
uh, inset, uh, even combed, very, very tight joints to, uh, and packed away so they couldn't be damaged uh, in that manner. Another thing we're going to see in these walls is a number of towers and platforms to fire back at the enemy. One of the things to keep them at bay was to fire back at them. And so defenses in this period became what we call an aggressive defense that might include firing platforms, sally ports, and gates so that you can and, uh, intercept the enemy. Go out and get them before they get close enough to cause you harm. And then the third thing we see is something the Germans called the Galanmauer system, in which they extended these walls far out into the countryside, away from the built landscape of the city. Part of this was they would take the high ground that an adversary, if it wasn't held, would position their weapons to fire on the city. So you see these walls extending out in the countryside, and the main reason seems to be to take the territory that might be used to barrage the built landscape of the city itself. And sometimes these things extend out for kilometers in that regard. So these are some of the examples of things that we were looking for in rough Cilicia. Uh, next slide. Uh, and as an example, the last five years, I've been working with a Turkish survey on the eastern side of Cilicia, near Selifke, the ancient colony of Seleucia on the Kalikatnos, founded by Seleucus I. And it's interesting that we have found fortifications, uh, both of the pre-Hellenic era, Hellenistic era, and the Hellenistic era, that kind of give us a model for what we were looking for. Uh, with the pirates. And we should add in that one of the interesting features of this region, it was suggested by a, a distinguished Turkish scholar, Sarah Durgunul, uh, who mapped in the area of Seleucia, and she was um, concerned that uh, the earliest permanent monuments of the region date to the period of Alexander's successors. There are very few preserved stone monuments of the previous era in this region. You know, why might that have been? Was it that primitive? It was a backwater, didn't get uh, an educated class capable of building these monuments? Or could it be because of the uh, timber in the mountains that everybody used wood? And so they built wooden houses and these do not survive on the in the archeological record. Uh, or maybe they were uh, transhuman herders. We know that they would drive the herds up into the uh, yilas, the meadows uh, in the summertime in Cilicia and you could feed your crop animals up there and then drive them down the countryside. If they're constantly mobile, then they probably lived in tents. Uh, so any number of these things are possible, but it is a curious phenomenon that uh, the earliest things we see are the remains of the um, Hellenistic period itself, which indicates that the region was relatively undeveloped until that period, and it's the successes of Alexander that needed the wood to build these massive fleets of theirs, and so they began to exploit, take a toehold, uh, in Cilicia. And the natives were very xenophobic. They didn't want to be disturbed. They resisted constantly these intrusions, things are right through to Roman times. Uh, this is a very xenophobic region of the Mediterranean. Okay, so looking to this eastern region, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and we have two examples. Uh, one is this Dana Island, kind of a notorious place we've been mapping. And what we found on the on the crest of this ridge of this island are these two ring forts, kind of stone fortifications. The largest one is about 150 meters across. The smallest one is about 60 meters across. They are just piles of rocks, hand size, palm size, maybe larger in the face, but in between, just this enormous fill of chipped stone that they quarry. Uh, right there. Chances are this was the foundation of what's known as a sockle to a taller structure, maybe mud brick or baked earth or wood superstructure above this. So the surviving stone sockle survives to about two meters uh, in height, and then maybe it went up another meter or two uh, above that. Uh, the reason we know that these are Iron Age is because when they built this wall, they threw broken pieces of pottery into the fill. So they're there in situ. Let's go to the next slide. And what we find are these regional forms known as basket-handled amphoras that were produced throughout the eastern Mediterranean. And their dates are given roughly uh, from about uh, 800 to about 300 BC. So before Alexander the Great. That seems to be the dividing point in that regard. And you, you can see the forms at the Animal Museum, but you can see the fragments of the handles and the toe that we found there in the fill of this fortress. So we can be pretty certain that these are 
pre-Hellenistic in that regard, and that they would have been, because of their small rock construction, they would have been extremely vulnerable to these artillery barrages, and therefore uh, not sustainable in the period following uh, Alexander the Great. Let's go to the next slide. Just down the shore, about eight miles away, there is this peninsula known as uh, Ovidic, and there is a small site on a spit of land known as Aphrodisias there, and above that we have a massive Hellenistic fortress. It extends as a line for two and a half kilometers. It has some 17 identified towers. Each tower is connected to a firing platform as well as a little sally port to the other side. Each tower has a door. There are joist ledges for a second story. Underneath probably was the holding place. These uh, torsion machines were very vulnerable to humidity and rain, and so you keep them dry. They can be pulled out. Each one of these towers has a stairway that gets you up on top, and you can see the, uh, uh, the 3D model uh, done by Matthew Conkley showing uh, the line. And here we are looking at a Hellenistic fortification system, uh, clearly intended as a kind of an aggressive defense, manned by a very large force, uh, and it could fire at the enemy and go out and assault the enemy as well. And, and notice the very large uh, polygonal but quarry-faced blocks in courses, relatively in courses, with very, very fine chiseled uh, joints in this regard. This is classic Seleucid defensive architecture. We find this throughout this region uh, in this regard. And it seems to almost be a semiotic template for how the Seleucids uh, built their defenses. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, and the reason we can feel fairly certain that this is Seleucid and maybe dates to precisely 300 BC is because when we surveyed in the terraces down below the mountain where the wall is, we found lots of not only Hellenistic pottery, but early Hellenistic pottery. You can see the, on the uh, one side, uh, the right, you can see the uh, handles again of the basket handled emperors, but you can also see things like the Canidian toe. You can see this imitation Thasian form in the upper uh, left, uh, probably from Cyprus, and then some Cypriot Hellenistic forms and Rhodian forms as well. Again, we were, it, why was this unique? Uh, most of this region, the pottery is late Roman and Byzantine. Here is one site where most of the pottery we process was Hellenistic. It co coordinates uh, with the walls and tells us this was some sort of important defensive structure, maybe to protect Seleucia on the Kalikatnos, designed by Seleucus himself, and we can date it to sometime like 300 to 280 uh, BC. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, so when we apply this to Western Rough Silesia, the survey I worked on, uh, we looked to up in the mountains in the Adanda Canyon, there is Lamos, uh, and it has this uh, late Roman fortification system, the walls of the Emperor Galerius. He has an inscribed uh, uh, memorial uh, above the gate into the right beside that tower. Uh, you can see it here with our Iconos uh, satellite map as well. Uh, and so that's clearly late Roman. It uses mortar, it's uh, flat surfaces and all of that. Uh, but let's go to the next slide. When we surveyed, we found the remains of an earlier structure inside the double wall there. You can see it here. And this is a tower, a very clearly of Hellenistic ashlar masonry. Uh, it's interesting. My theory is that in the area where the Ptolemies controlled rough Cilicia, we see this ashlar masonry as a template. But somewhere in the eastern region, starting at Ovidic, we see a transition to this polygonal masonry that extends all the way up to Mersin. And that maybe these are very distinct telltale signs of the western half was Ptolemaic and the eastern half was Seleucid, and there might even have been sort of a DMZ between the two. We can narrow it uh, that convincingly on the basis of the architecture. But here we see classic Hellenistic fortification, uh, a tower, maybe a firing tower, lookout tower, uh, embedded in the ancient remains. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and there are several like this. I mean, we've already mentioned Coracesion, Alanya, and the, here we see uh, the gate, uh, and it's kind of crude, but this is uh, about the same time, crude ashlar masonry, uh, probably of the Ptolemaic era. 
there you have uh, Lamos, the tower, uh, at Salinas, a harbor town not too far from uh, Alanya. Actually, it's uh, uh, the ancient city, the modern town of Ghazi Pasha. Uh, there is a Celtic forces on top of the Acropolis, but in the walls you can see the courses of Ashlar masonry. They're clearly a Hellenistic system right there. And then near Alanya, there's a, there's a mountain site, uh, Hamaxia, wagon town, where they would bring the cedar down, is what Straber tells us, from the mountains to send out to sea. Uh, there is a ring wall there. I didn't want to waste too much time doing this, uh, but in the middle of the ring wall, they built a Hellenistic Ashlar masonry tower that could fire over the ring wall uh, in the Hellenistic period. And so what's my point here uh, it is that um, uh, maybe the pirates didn't have to build fortifications. They simply took them, inherited them, and secured this region. The point is that we minimal architecture to demonstrate a Hellenistic horizon in this region, but what we have uh, fits with the format of this primitive fortification systems, trying to tap into the timber resources of the highlands and control the trade moving along the shore. Okay, next slide. Uh, now let's look at phase two, the pedestrian survey. Uh, we've got my, my colleague Max Black here, and he's found a novel way to wear his GPS on his hat while using the IPAC. So what we tried to do is, uh, this is just kind of systematic survey. We're picking up ancient trash on the ground, broken pieces of pottery that comes up from plowing or erosion or whatever kind of disturbances. And we just try to process it in C2, take a GPS point, take a photograph, add our data, and then try to leave it undisturbed. I mean, one of the things about survey is that it's a very inobtrusive means for conducting archaeological investigation in such a way that maybe somebody could come by 50 years from now with more advanced technology and revisit the place in relatively the same shape. For example, using drone technology uh, as a sign of the future. So let's go to the next slide. You can see how we do this. We just line up like a military platoon. We use various intervals, coarse or close uh, interval. Uh, and then sometimes we call perspective survey. If we just got a little bit of time on the site, we just kind of run around picking up pottery and processing it and GPS. Uh, every piece of pottery we have processed is has coordinates, real world coordinates. You can go to PER and you can look at our survey data. Some 10,000 pieces of pottery that we process with about 20,000 images. Uh, this is a very robust um, uh, archive. You can, uh, menus drop down, you can forage for very specific forms uh, and come out with data. This is just waiting to be utilized by graduate students of the future. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, just some more views of us in the field processing. Uh, the, the lower one where everybody's got their IPAX, this is at uh, Asar Tepe. Uh, and uh, we had one case at Asar Tepe where we were walking on the wall of a, of a temple tomb in the wall gateway and one of my students tumbled down with a wall uh, and used our GPS and IPAC to break her fall. Uh, she was not hurt, fortunately, but you can see the damage done to our uh, machines. And this is rough Cilicia. This is what we uh, anticipate. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, and again, because we're picking up trash, this is broken pieces of pottery. This is not really photogenic stuff. It's not museum quality for the most part, but it does. Here's some, some of our better looking pieces in this regard. So, for example, um, uh, in the uh, lower corner, you have a uh, Iron Age form. It is some sort of maybe Cilician imitation of Cypriot uh, um, um, painted ware. Uh, in the middle there, you can see the rim of a Phoenician emperor that was found at Karadros. And then there's this hand turn, maybe T thing uh, that looks pretty early, but it was um, uh, most of it was done on the wheel. Down in the other lower corner, we have a Hellenistic fish plate uh, that dates to the third century BC, black slipped. And then we've got some lithics that we have found. And then, but most of the pottery that we have is this Roman stuff. So there is uh, maybe Sagalassos ware with a, a Megarian bowl with a molded bowl with a rabbit on it. Uh, up there, we see a Phocian wall plaque with the Cairo Christian emblem uh, of the later period. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, in aggregate, what do we end up with? Just raw aggregate. This is what uh, a curve that we have seen repeatedly in our survey. It doesn't seem to matter how much we continue processing, it doesn't really change. And what you see is this very minimal evidence based on pottery of occupation in this region until the early Roman period, and then it spikes. 
it spikes with the Pax Romana. This place became thoroughly developed in the Roman era, producing its own wine, its own olive oil for distribution, its own form, the pinched handled amphora, sending out produce throughout the Mediterranean world. But it took stability and peace before people could really invest uh, in this region. Uh, the late Roman period is also pretty significant. We like to say the fall of Rome was kind of a slow burn. Uh, but notice that even that is significantly higher than the remains of the Hellenistic period, which tells us that these places were tiny. They were nothing more than roadsteads and little lagoonal harbors where merchants could put in in this way. They would not have been difficult for pirates to seize. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, looking specifically at Antioch, so in 1996, we conducted a very thorough, 1997, a uh, very thorough examination. Uh, you can see what we use with that because with grab collections, you can see the various CA means collection area. We got up to, I think, 16 collection areas. A collection area, we kind of mark out an area about 100 meters and everybody spreads out, picks up the pottery. We bring it all together. We go through it, process it, kind of triage it for diagnostic shirts that give us the information. Again, primarily what we're looking for were dates, datable pottery. So we can say, okay, this site, here's this, Hellenistic piece, it seems to have been occupied as early as the Hellenistic period, and then we've got lots of stuff right through to the late Roman period. Sometimes we found sites that were single era, only early Roman, like Kestros, or only late Roman, like Machar. Uh, but for the most part, the big urban sites had very, very long sustained occupation, again, on a minimal scale in this period, and they blossomed in the Roman and the late Roman periods. Antioch is the perfect example of this. We surveyed and surveyed here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, there is a kind of a fortress, uh, at least a corner of wall of ashlar blocks up on a mountain above Antioch. Uh, it really needs to be further investigated. Uh, but as he said, the city dates to the founding of the city by Antiochus IV of Comagene. Uh, and so, uh, there's no remains before that period. Here's the pottery breakdown. You can see how early Roman, late Roman, and Byzantine dominate maybe six pieces. And again, six pieces don't mean there's a Hellenistic find there. So uh, I was very disappointed when we did our survey at Antioch. I was counting on this one giving us the information that we needed. Uh, and we're talking about the pedestrian survey uh, in that regard. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Uh, and then in 2004, we had the uh, good fortune to have Cheryl Ward join us and do a maritime survey using a sonar device uh, and a coordinated Turkish American team. Uh, and they were just, they were basically looking for shipwrecks, but the first place they went to was this embayment near Antioch, which we now know was the harbor of Antioch. And uh, sure enough, first day out, she found the remains that I had been looking for for years. So let's uh, go to the next slide. Uh, there's your view of the harbor. It shows the position of the harbor next to the Pirate's Cove. Uh, and what she found was what we call the head or the upper portion of a Lambolia II amphora from Apulia in Italy that dates to 100 to 40-ish BC. These are the very forms that survive in enormous quantities at Delos and that we were looking for. And she found it right in the harbor at Antioch, along with a dozen anchor remains uh, and various other forms, including the most spectacular find of our entire survey. She found this small ship's ornament in the shape of a pegasus, a winged horse. It's about 16 centimeters long. It's made out of um, lead, or excuse me, bronze. Uh, and again, the pegasus immediately associates with the chimera at uh, Olympos, but that's another matter uh, right there. Uh, but without even trying, she found the stuff that I had spent years looking for in this way. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And in fact, uh, this obviously projected from some sort of a post uh, on a superstructure of a ship. It was an ornament, a small ornament. Uh, it has a socket hole in the back. We were able, we noticed that there was wood residue in the socket. We were able to extract some of the residue and we carbon dated it. And we got a date of 126 BC. Now, 
Uh, this date tells us the date at which the tree was cut. It then had to be uh, processed and turned into a beam and put into the socket and put on this uh, ship. Uh, but even allowing 10 years for that or five years for that, what we are seeing is an ornament found in the harbor of Antioch that dates precisely to the period of pirates, though I must add the caveat, uh, plus or minus 200 years. This is the nature of carbon dating. Uh, however, the lab uh, told me that uh, actually they look at certain uh, parabolas and when they get really, really close, as they were in this case, they felt very, very confident that this was the date. Uh, but it's a tantalizing and taunting sort of process of every time I get a piece of evidence, well, plus or minus 200 years. I mean, this is the nature of survey. It's not like excavation. It's a very fuzzy resolution. Uh, that only grows clearer as you get further spread out over the landscape and acquire more and more ter terrain. That's when it's at its best. Uh, but at a, at a close interval, um, it's a very uh, sketchy resolution. Let's do it, think of it that way. But still, um, let's think about this. And that is that um, um, an important thing I need to stress. Uh, and that is that um, um, the town of Antioch on the Kragos was not founded until 54 AD. We have evidence here that somebody was using that harbor, maybe the Pirates Cove, where there's natural springs, in the period of the pirates. Now, maybe it wasn't a settlement, maybe it was just shippers going by, but it still shows us that the place was in use prior to its settlement in the early Roman era. And what Appian tells us is that in the period in which that amphora was used, it was inhabited by pirates. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, and in fact, I've been working along the entire coast of Rough Cilicia. I had the extreme good fortune of being invited to process the amphora collection in the Anamur Archaeological Museum. Anamur is kind of halfway between Ghazi Pasha and Salifke. It's on the south coast, about 40 miles from uh, Ghazi Pasha, moving east. Uh, and there in the depot, there are a number of these Rambolia II uh, amphoras. Uh, uh, and in fact, they are found in the region. Um, so these are artifacts that date to the pirate era. They seem to be associated with the pirates, but the reality is, you know, they're also found in Cyprus. They're also found in Israel. They're found, enormous quantities were found uh, in Egypt that remain unpublished. And so you could simply argue this is uh, evidence of Roman trade. Somebody's moving Roman goods in these waters. It doesn't necessarily mean it's pirates, despite the hypothesis of Andre Chernia, and we have to concede as much. Now let's go to the next slide. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, what we're looking at is um, basically that the Cilician pirates, if they did exist, they left a very minimal archeological footprint. But that is something characteristic of pirates. I try to stress, they don't build baths, they don't build council houses, they don't build much at all. They're escaping labor. They lived in tipped over ships. They drank to excess and they winced and played music. Uh, what we're told is when Pompey besieged the pirates at uh, 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 Antioch, they surrendered without a fight. They were probably too drunk to fight. It was only a Caucasian where they put up a fight uh, in that regard. Uh, and so maybe, uh, maybe we shouldn't expect to see a very significant uh, footprint in that regard. Uh, from the perspective of the built environment, there were a few permanent structures of the time of the pirates, but what we have, uh, there are uh, fortifications, and this is something they would have needed in that regard. Um, can we, we have the maritime remains at Antioch on the Kragos, and they are contemporary with the pirates, but can we be certain that they were the pirates in that regard? Uh, one thing we know about pirates is that um, they tended to disperse. They needed uh, um, to be able to hide uh, because otherwise Rhodian and Roman navies could track them down. So they've got to constantly relocate. They constantly have to hide out in this uh, archipelago uh, uh, of uh, islands and coves along the Mediterranean coast. And so uh, they're not going to leave necessarily a permanent footprint in any uh, single place. And so, um, you know, that looking for that is probably um, uh, overly ambitious, shall we say. 
Uh, but I would make one more point, and that is that in a region where piracy was uh, rampant, this is not a place where you're going to see a lot of economic development. You're not going to see people building towns if they're going to be worried about pirates or pirates are taking over their fortresses and what have you. And so in a way, piracy uh, locally could create a kind of depressed economic conditions. Uh, and the uh, point I would leave you with is that uh, it is interesting when we look for evidence that is contemporary with the era of the pirates in Cilicia. The evidence that survives are these Hellenistic towers and the Lambolia II amphoras uh, from Delos, exactly the kind of thing that we were using in the first place to identify the archaeological footprint of pirates. So what I would respond to people who are skeptical and justifiably skeptical is, okay, this is what the sources tell us. This is what we found. This stuff is here. If it's not the pirates, then you tell me who was there at that time. Now let's go to the next slide. And so I leave you at the Pirate's Cove at Antioch uh, on the Kragos and hope that uh, you enjoyed the talk and that it uh, will uh, help to inform your uh, awareness of Ruxilicia in the future. Thank you very much.